Hello, everyone. Welcome to the J3U podcast. I'm your host, John Jewett, and with me as always, co-host Luke Miller. What's up, man? Not much, man. Just recovering from nationals this past weekend. So I yeah. Guess um, slept forever. Big congratulations to you. To you as well. Yeah. Both <laughs> home with pro cards. So that's... Uh, we that's both had pro card wins. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Go J3U. <laughs> right. Hell yeah. No, it's, it's super exciting. It's always a really rewarding on that that pro card um i've had like you know pro wins and things like that but it's still like that transition point is so meaningful because it's by an amateur it's just you, everyone's so hungry for it and then after that it kind of really opens up again to like you know winning a pro show getting olympia but still that pro card where it's like there, there's nothing else like it. it only happens once you can win pro shows multiple you know multiple times maybe but the pro card that's a that's a once in a lifetime thing so it's so meaningful and on both ends, coach and athlete. Yeah. Mitch is still buzzing about it. He, he says it still hasn't sunk in yet. Like he, I told him that he, he would be in the running for one at the beginning of this prep. And he, he said he didn't believe me <laughs> and then he ended up coming home with one. So um, pretty that's cool. So, that's so cool. It's always, that's always a favorite athlete mindset to coach. Um, a kind of hard time seeing their potential. And because it's a, it's a humble, it's a humble approach. Right. Um, and then to see them rewarded for it, it's still kind of like a surprise factor for them. And uh, it's just the people you want to see do great. Right. Yeah. It was, it was funny because they actually had the numbers on stage for the trophy girls for prejudging. So they had like one, two, three, four, five. Oh, okay. When you were on stage, you knew where you were. Oh. And so like he got moved last, like, three poses into that second spot and when they called him off he was like i, I fucking did it because like he was <laughs> like he saw the trophy girl number <laughs> it was it was awesome man oh that that's so cool and uh and, and and my guy he he's been a client with me for over two years this was our second strike at nationals which he was a, a walter weight um which is a pretty competitive class uh a lot of guys come in really conditioned he he has just awesome shape and symmetry, good size. It was hard to make weight. Usually I'm not someone that he, he basically didn't eat or drink until he had to weigh in and he had to wait a little bit to weigh in, but uh, it was all in his favor and it worked out well. Um, I think last year we were like tail in, like it, it early on in the third call out. So it's like, Oh man, you know, this, this isn't what we wanted at all. And so to move up now and he wanted it so bad, it, it was just uh, awesome. So good weekend. Good weekend. But well, uh, we have a fun topic for today. I think we should yeah, I think so. This is a, like a series, depending on when you're listening to this, you might already have the other ones listened to. <laughs> um, but just talking on prophylactic strategies within bodybuilding to yep. mitigate risk, um, lower it, just a, a kind of a less harm approach if we can. And one to talk on today was a blood pressure medications and their role yep. in the enhanced physique competitor. And of course, so this would of course apply if you actually had some type of cardiovascular diseases or hypertension. Luke and I are not doctors, so this is all just for entertainment and bullshit. We don't know. <laughs> <anything>. <laughs> but um, no, we'll, we'll dive, dive into the topic, I think, yeah. to... Set up, you just have to know, because I have people say like, uh, no, they're proud to not take a blood pressure medication and rightfully so. We don't want to be having to take medications, but there is some inherent risk of being an enhanced bodybuilder. And there's a setup of what we know kind of just occurs in bodybuilding with seeing people pass away and the, the physiological issues that we see. So, I mean, we have a few, one being, being hypertension, right? Yep. I think. I think one of the big things too is just kind of like setting up the the constructs of PED use in general, creating that that influence on like angiotensin that's going to end up in a result that's going to require some type of influence. And I know we're going to get into the classes of blood pressure medications as well, um, but understanding that this is all coming from the prerequisite understanding that the PED usage is having a net influence on our physiology, not only from an androgen receptor standpoint but in in another standpoint as well um and and making sure that we are able to 
manage that and, and, and account for it for the long-term health metrics that we're wanting to keep in play over the long term, right? This is the whole reason we go about talking like safer PED use and the models that we use within our clientele is like making sure that we not only get them to the pro card win, right? But we get them into competing long into their pro career. So um, I think it kind of good place to kick off with the classes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and perfectly, like, like you said, like we want to be able to extend this career for 10 years, if you're a pro, um, and then also have time after <laughs> there's life after bodybuilding and, that's uh, a lot of these strategies to utilize is to continue to so you can be at the top of your game for a long period of time. And, uh, you know, wh why, why are PEDs, what is the, the risk behind these around, we hear about renal failure, heart failure, mm -hmm. and it's driven by these processes. Um, I mean, just for one, like some of the leading issues with kidney disease is high blood pressure and diabetes, which we do put ourselves at risk of being enhanced by billers. We can increase blood pressure and with the use of just girl hormone and pushing high amounts of foods, you can't elevate blood glucose. And if you're susceptible to diabetes, you, that could be an issue. Um, then just with, with steroids, just in general and growth hormone and this system that we'll talk on, is the renin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This whole system regulates basically blood volume, blood pressure, but using a steroid or using growth hormone, uh, we know it works on this system and causes an upregulation of RAAS <laughs> to increase blood pressure. And with that increase in blood pressure, there's more vascular resistance and more strain on just the vessels, more strain on the heart, more strain on the kidneys. Uh, we also know this, they increase um, um, oxidative stress on the kidneys and cause apoptosis and, and cell death and increase inflammatory cytokines. So we all, all this occurs with seeing inflammation of the kidneys, uh, of the hearts, and we see kidney scarring occurring because you have receptors for uh, androgens, growth hormone, they're all, all in the kidney and the heart. And so they impact all those tissues, just like we want them just impacting skeletal muscle. Yep. So it makes a lot of sense. If, if these are the issues that are surrounding using PDs, what is there something in place that can counter this system? As we know, the, the main driver behind this is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This increase is what's increasing pr pressure and stress along the whole system. So what can we do to actually impact it? <laughs> and uh, we have some classes of medications that really fit the bill of, of direct deployment that would impact the system. Yeah, and so I think a lot of people <clears throat> look to just blood, pre blood pressure medication in general without taking into consideration the fact that we may have opportunities to choose ones that would be better and influence for the net toll that we're going to have as bodybuilders. Yeah. Um, so probably a quick overview of the classes would be good. So um, obviously we have ARB, so angiotensin uh, receptor blockers, um, ACE inhibitors, um, beta blockers, uh, obviously like your diuretics um, and then calcium channels. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. So your, your main four classes, um, I remember them by ABCD. <laughs> they, they, they do. They go by those. Those, those names. Um, and uh, yeah, usually your ACE inhibitors are the ones that end in Pril. Uh, ARBs are the Sartans. You know, beta blockers usually have a, a lol at the end. Um, diuretics are usually like thiazides. Not always, but a lot of the times the ones that are impacting blood pressure. And then the diapenes are your calcium channel blockers. And so I can kind of scratch off the last three beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics, because those aren't really impacting the system that is drive, driven from PD usage, which is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So we want something that works more specific on that, on that system. Now, there is a hypertension driven um, with low renin levels. And that might, you might have application for another blood pressure medication. That is definitely for you and your physician to deep discuss. But the primary mechanism for increased stress with PD usage would be the renin angiotensin system. 
and it, uh, just just so you know like i know this is a lot of wordy stuff here the f- quickest rundown on on how the whole like this the system just kind of works is that the, the kidneys produce um renin and this is usually from a decrease in renal perfusion so a decrease in blood flow to the kidneys so the kidneys since this renin's released it goes to the liver and the liver produces a protein called angiotensinogen renin will convert that into angiotensin type 1 that then goes to the lungs and this is at the lungs you have a uh, angiotensin converting enzyme so this is where your ace inhibitor would work um, at1 is converted to angiotensin type 2 and that's what the real player in the game is is angiotensin 2 then goes to all these other tissues um, it goes to the blood vessels and causes vasoconstriction which increases blood pressure it goes to the brain and increases antidiuretic hormone which is caused water reabsorption in the kidneys so you have an increase in blood volume um, it also goes to the adrenal glands and, and increases aldosterone, which causes sodium reabsorption. And again, an increase in blood volume. So you have blood vessels getting small an increase in, in sodium and water in the blood, increase in blood volume, which means high blood pressure. It's a system we need in place if, if you have a, a drop in, in blood volume and perfusion. But the issue becomes is when you have too much and then you have this, this occur and we have these agents in place that basically can be deployed for different mechanisms around that. Um, Blood pressure is a a formula. (laughs) It's a cardiac output times um, vascular resistance, which is basically the diameter of your blood vessels. And so we have these in place that can decrease uh, the volume of blood, which would decrease your stroke volume and your cardiac output. And they also would decrease vascular resistance. So keeping the blood vessels open. So that's really how they impact this system as a whole. And so your ACE inhibitors are working on at the lungs to decrease that enzyme and your ARBs are blocking the receptor site that are in the adrenal glands, the kidney, and uh, on, the, on the blood vessels to prevent angiotensin II from having those impacts. And also the impacts that it, that has with oxidative stress and inflammation as well. So that's kind of just your quick your quickest rundown on this whole pathway and how it kind of flows the body and where the drugs are actually taking their actions. And so we're kind of left with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB being like the main Amazing. ones to really deploy as, as options. And I know ACE inhibitors have kind of been the, the first uh, deployment for hypertensive um, patients. Uh, then this, this, and they have indications too, if you've had like a, a heart attack um, or uh, heart failure, and you want to decrease stress on the heart, this is what they do. Yeah. And they decrease stress load on the heart. So they have deployment in those instances and for different d- conditions around cardiovascular disease, depending on how they're deployed. But a lot of times we're kind of discussing them as a preventative prophylactic strategy, not necessarily if you have high blood pressure which is where we kind of start to bring up the conversation of the comparison between ARBs and ACE inhibitors, right? And um, we do, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe we do have data on less side effects based issues with like ARBs versus like ACE inhibitors. Um, yeah, there, there is some comparison. That's actually a pretty uh, fairly recent one comparing the mon- monotherapy. So whether it's an ACE or an ARB <clears throat> and there is less side effects with, ARBs, and that's actually the the indication to go to an ARB if someone is having a side effect with an ACE, ACE inhibitor, which it, it could be around the lung since you're blocking ACE around the lung, um, mm-hmm. can have some breathing challenges, um, also can have increased potassium levels, kind of really with, with both. Some people get angioedema, which is like swelling of tongue in, in the face. Uh, but just as a whole, ARBs have a little bit less side effects. There's still a risk with them of having increased uh, potassium levels, but it's uh, more of a rare occurrence. And even for a, a prophylactic deployment for these compounds, we're not taking them to the, the upper end. So something to be considered of, but being that there is a less risk of side effect with an ARB, um, I lean towards that and... Uh, for some of the other 
one of the ones specifically that we that we like to utilize and it's also its other benefits so I, i've kind of ruled down to just an arb being being a choice yep. um, over the ace inhibitor which is where we commonly hear the famous one tom sartan thrown oh, around in, <laughs> yeah thrown around in our discussions um i think it would be <clears throat> maybe a little pertinent to discuss the main reasons for deployment from a prophylactic standpoint, because I think it is kind of made into this sexy compound that we can deploy to influence pathways from like a, almost like a PED perspective. Um, and just kind of maybe some of the conversation around why mainly prophylactically we would be deploying it and some of the things we've seen within our clients as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And you know, if, if you don't have Telmasartan, um, really any ARB is going to have, of course, different dosing, but the outcomes with reducing the risk that we're talking about will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, Telmasartan has an added benefit of working on the PPAR pathway. And so this is, this is what we're, we're talking about is, is uh, people have made a comparison to carterine, which is a, it's a banned substance by WADA. It works uh, very strongly on the PPAR pathway uh, and can increase endurance. Um, Telmosardin works fairly weakly on that pathway. H however, it, as, as far as like a performance enhancement goes, but through that same pathway, it does have some good metabolic action. So by saying that it's going to have a outcome for hypertrophy, not directly in my opinion, but I, I would say be the means of being able to extend periods of enhancement, um, whether that be elevation of dosage or duration, and also being able to tolerate higher amounts of food, just is everything that drives anabolic processes. You could have a greater outcome by that, uh, but not directly through the use of telmasartan and its yeah. actions. 100%. 100%. Um, now, the, the other aspects of why I like it, um, comparatively to some of the other compounds around, um, is for, high, for at least for hypertension, if you are hypertensive, it's shown just as effective as any ACE inhibitor. Um, as far as the duration of action, it's about 24 hours. So like a single day dosing is, uh, can be beneficial. Um, it also can decrease the development of left ventricular hypertrophy. And this is, again, this is going to be across the board with ARBs. More stress, there's, if there's more um, preload coming into the heart and the heart's having to work harder, that can increase ventricular hypertrophy, which is a common issue. And we're not just talking about an athlete's heart. This is an, uh, an enhanced athlete's heart. So it's a, a non-functioning increase in heart contractility. Um, and, and law, basically loss of, of function. So this decreases that, that effect. Uh, there's also improvements in renal function and less uh, protein and uh, creatine, uh, pro, sorry, protein losses. And uh, even with endothelial function, there's a reduced, telomosardin can reduce like arterial stiffness, which is something that happens with age, but, but also when we're exposing ourselves to higher amounts of angiotensinogen. And then, a de then it's also been shown to even decrease markers of inflammation like C-reactive protein um, and interleukin-6. And then, of course, and then, and then, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? So one, one issue that we, we definitely face with enhancement in this androgens in general is an increase in red blood cell production, yes. and which does increase blood viscosity. And just ARB monotherapy shows a significant reduction in uh, red blood cell count, hematocrit, and, and hemoglobin. So this issue that we're usually having with increase in erythrocytosis and blood viscosity, just ARB ther therapy alone can, re can reduce that. And just from my own personal experience, I haven't had a need to do any bloodletting or blood donation or anything like that in uh, two years now. Um, since since utilizing it and so i my hematocrit level usually is right around 50 to 52 percent 
I never let it usually if it was 54 and or above is when I would be very, more concerned in, in doing something like that. But since utilizing this, I've never needed to do one since then. Yeah. And then that's, that was kind of some of the stuff we were talking off camera from an anecdotal perspective is like the improvements in lab work along clientele has been just unbelievably huge. Like, especially within the confines of the populations that do struggle with managing CBCs, like obviously compound selection can help with that and managing cycles a little bit better. But um, just when we look at, and for some of these guys, it's been something that's been like across the last two years for them as well. You can look at panels like two years ago and follow them across the years. And it's just such a drastic improvement, even in states of high stress, right? Like if we compare state of high stress to state of high stress, just the, the average at which we're staying at is a lot better. The need for bloodletting is a lot lower. Um, and just overall management of like health outcomes creates a, a better long-term vision. I think that that's where a lot of the value is like from the use just in prophylactic measures as a whole is like creating that, that runway and like understanding how we can improve lab work and deploy these prophylactic measures, depending on what we're struggling with as a, for yourself or a clientele. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, just the, of course, access is one thing to talk That's about. Um, just one one last point about the benefits of it. I mean, because that's that was one. Just uh, being able to manage your your CBC panel was one that I think is a little bit more unique to tell Masard and why I, I would pick it is that it has been shown to have some good um, impact on metabolic function mm -hmm. and improving fasting blood glucose levels than the other ARBs and which reducing fasting plasma insulin levels as well. And, um, just insulin resistance and all, all that is through like the PPAR, that pathway, uh, which can regulate, um, mainly your, your adipose tissue produces adipokines, um, one being adiponectin, which does have a role in insulin resistance and, fatty acid oxidation metabolism, telmasarin influences that. And so that is a unique aspect of it that we also face within bodybuilding is managing inflammation, insulin resistance. And so you have additional added benefit of telmasarin impacting that. Yep. So all these, all these, these boxes that are, are there for the risk around bodybuilders is hypertension, oxidation, inflammation, stress, higher um, elevations in hematocrit levels, higher blood glucose and, infl and, and uh, insulin resistance, Telmosard impacts all those. And it's extremely low risk as well. Um, and so it, even if you weren't hypertensive, all the other benefits are rationale, at least for me to be deploying it. That's for a discussion for you and your doctor, I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, um, and... Um, that's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a huge player even for, for blood glucose. It, it, it impacts it for sure, but I think more so, and even for blood pressure, the higher you are, the more impactful it is. Um, and I would say if you have normal blood pressure, it doesn't lower it to a hypotensive state. You just stay normal basically, mm -hmm. but the higher BP, the more impactful. And, uh, at least within telmosartan dosing wise what you see in like literature for for individuals that actually are hypertensive is usually 40 to 80 milligrams 80 milligrams being the top end uh but that if doesn't mean that you might have a deployment that starts around 20 milligrams and maybe that would es escalate up based around your needs um so even if you had a phases where you're escalating dosages up and of course that would uh, also increase that Ren and angiotensin system more. Maybe that's a time where you escalate up your telmasar and your ARB usage, um, or you just run a constant, which is kind of what I would use do anyway. Um, yeah, I use it constantly too. I think too, like on the access issue too. Just to comment. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think having an understanding of this is really important, and it's kind of why we discuss this because coming to a medical practitioner for a prescription with some sort of base of understanding and, and having a logical conversation with a practitioner always ends in a better result in finding a solution that will fit 
um, and being able to consult with someone who may be like a specialist in that field. So like a cardiologist or something along those lines, right? We, we've already had the discussion about testing and how we should probably be having a, seeing a cardiologist to do um, our echoes and things along those lines every so often. So we probably should have some practitioner that would be able to have that conversation with you. Um, and part of the reason we put out like content like this, going over a little bit more of a deep dive on just managing this through these, these medications and prophylactic measures is being able to take this information and, and map it out and just kind of have this dialogue with your practitioner. I have seen from an access standpoint has made things a lot easier for my clientele to get prescriptions for it. Um, so that they can have a net positive influence. If you just come in with the logical rationale, now you're going to run into to stubborn practitioners, right? That's going to happen. But I, I've always found that preparing my clients with some sort of discourse to be able to logically walk through with with the practitioner is is important pro part of the process and getting them on board and helping you manage your your health outcomes. Yeah, and I think if you were to approach a physician and not be able to have that conversation with them, that wouldn't be the best physician that I would want to trust my healthcare with. Agreed. And so you, de you definitely want something, just like when you're hiring a coach for a contest prep, like you want something that's willing to collaborate with you and not just do this, don't question it. Like you need to have understanding of things that you're putting in your body, um, but you need someone that's also willing to listen to your feedback and uh, respect what you have, you're not, I, I know we're not doctors and maybe you are not a doctor that's listening. So to approach a doctor, like, like they think, Oh, look at this, this arrogant person, wet, red web MD and no, <laughs> too much no. Google. Um, <laughs> so you, you, there's, there is a, uh, approach it with humility. Yes. Um, and with question, with question towards understanding, not question towards your doctor's credibility. And through that, you'll have a much more chance of having a, a, an open conversation with them. If they're still not open to it, usually I find that just, it's a physician that's like running so quickly and doesn't have a lot of time to sit with their patients, but there's ones out there. Um, and so that's, that's just the one to, to shop around for and, and find. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, there is sourcing outside of you know, going through with your physician and that is for you to find on your own. <laughs> However, you, there's a means for you to do that or these uh, online pharmacies, depending on your country. Um, you know, this is at least within the US, you need a script, but like in some other countries, you know, you, you can just walk in and, and ask for these things. So depending on what country is and we don't know all your rules or laws there. So um, depending on what you'd have to go through to have access to something like that. Yeah, I think that kind of covers. What was that. there anything else, Luke, that you've noticed just um, just anecdotally through coaching with with utilizing it? Uh, or like, uh, honestly, a little bit surprised at how robust the metabolic parameters were from a coaching perspective, as far as like managing athletes across the fluctuations of seasons, especially kind of like more into like all season phases, um, but especially for me, the standout was definitely the CBCs. Like kind of like I discussed before, just like some of my guys have been with me a little bit longer that we've seen the implementation of Tomasartan specifically, just to kind of name the one that I'm leaning towards using most of the time. Um, the improvements in the CBC parameters that just like consistently improve and improve and improve. And uh, it, it's something that's for my clientele base, as people who are interested in this portion of the process fairly, fairly deeply, it's so much buy-in at one point, but satisfaction with the coaching experience as another, because they're able to see not only their physique improve, but then their lab work improve within the confines of the risks they're willing to take, right? So we, we know that PEDs have inherent risks. We accept that going into what we're doing, but able, being able to manage it better than they were before just creates like a net positive outcome that it's huge. And the CBCs have probably been the, the biggest one um, that I've seen improvements on, on parameters with for, for myself. Yeah. You, you had something that came, came to mind too, that I don't know. We just talked about how it impacts just, just these health markers and that allows you to extend these phases out. Um, but one that might have a direct actual impact on aesthetics that I just forgot to kind of even mention was, 
that the main driver behind water retention from anabolics is through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And just like, what do you, you hear a lot of people take on peak week diuretics <laughs> to reduce water um, or even, you know, aldosterone receptor blockers and big, big reason behind the PED usage is that it causes water retention. Um, that might be also estrogen related. If it was really, really high, I, I wouldn't say my means to wouldn't be to be, take something to block estrogen. That's another conversation. Um, but uh, you know, even off my experience, estrogen, even a little higher, isn't the main thing that's causing water retention, especially during going into a show it's main more so from this rise that we see in aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. And so taking an ARB during prep, you will find that you do present with that harder look because you won't have that driven um, anabolic driven androgen driven water retention present. So this is something that you could take throughout a, a prep. And that's what I, what I've done. I, I take it throughout my entire prep. And I've, I brought a very hard look. Um, of course, I was skinned out, no body fat. <laughs> so there's not going to be a lot of water retention around the fat cells because they're so low, small anyway. Uh, but this is something that you could deploy and, and have uh, some aesthetic benefit to it that I just kind of slipped my mind to, to mention. Yeah, I think that's an important one to, to list too, because especially with the comment like, I, I get this, like for people who are a little bit more normotensive, like, is it going to bring me hypo? And it's like, well, yeah. like, let's, let's discuss the dosing that we're going to use and how we're going to use it and the prophylactic measures in which we're using it and to create that outcome that we want visually um, is, is important to include. And I think that that's something that can ease the minds of people that are a little bit more normotensive. Like, why am I taking a blood pressure medication? Right. Well, there, there are prophylactic measures that are benefits to taking this as well. Yeah, and this should be coupled along with every other strategy that you can deploy mm -hmm. if, if you were hypertensive, but also around all the other things that Luke and I have mentioned around the, the inflammation, oxidation, um, any lipid skewing, like all these are things like deploy, by all means, uh, dietary strategies, exercise strategies uh, to improve those systems. But this is one that I think can be in place as well on top of those, if you're stepping into the territory of super physiological. Um, and that would apply for, for males and females, in my opinion, as well, because going super physiological beyond what's normal, it, it would, in my opinion, have some indication for this. Yeah. Uh, and, and now if, if you're staying within a norm or you're natural, uh, uh, you're not exposing yourself to the risk, like stepping out into the super physiological realm. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have, have like a hypertensive, uh, that's another, that's a different conversation. Obviously you, you'd want to have some uh, deployment of something like this, but within our conversation that where I, I, at least in my mind, it's regarding around the enhanced athlete moving into the super physiological state. Yeah. And I think that a little bit outside the confines of that too, just as a quick topper is like, when we look at strategies within hypertension like getting active using cardiovascular activity alongside this too like especially i see this in the all season a lot like get lazy they don't do their, their cardiovascular activity not getting the heart rate elevation that we need to see in order to see improved parameters on that end so that can be used in conjunction with this right like there's there's ways that we can do as coaches um, within the non prescriptive measures that we can we can take yeah definitely i think that rounds it out really well man yeah, I do too. Yeah, okay. That was <laughs> well, well, cool guys. If uh, for upcoming stuff, um, if you want to dive deeper into learning more about just how to manage health, lower risk in enhanced bodybuilding, or just health in general, uh, again, J3 University you have a full health module and PD module that shows this entire approach. And Luke and I are there in the forums to answer all your questions. We have people that are posting lab work and we're running through them and it's extremely detailed, um, more so than I think in any other forums where you have um, educators that are present to answer questions. So um, again, appreciate y'all tuning in. Um, if you're on YouTube, leave any comments or questions below, happy to answer those for you. And we will talk to you next time.